The Plantain Incident, or How I Learned to Stop Hating Kevin and Appreciate the Alien Planet by Michael Dowswell. Prologue. Mankind is facing a severe crisis at the moment. The popular fruit known as the banana refuses to grow on Earth. Many astronauts have been sent out to try and find a similar fruit for cultivating. Derek is one of these brave souls. And Derek doesn't even like bananas. Chapter 1. A Nasty Fire The escape pod landed near to the crash site. Derek emerged. It was nighttime, and the fire was raging. It was very loud, very hot, and very bright. Derek suddenly said, Somebody, grab the marshmallows. It was clearly fuel that had caught fire. The ship had crashed in a desert. It actually split and separated into two large pieces when it hit the mountain, sort of like the British cruise ship HMS Titanic, but not really. Each piece was now embedded into the sand. A deep chasm was alongside one of the pieces. The terrain was full of strange horn-like structures, tons of stones that looked similar to the sandstone, honeycomb, weathering erosion we get on Earth. Derek suddenly said, I bet this is Kevin's fault, always on his phone, always flirting with the flight mechanic women. As he was looking at the fire. Chapter 2, The Bridge when Derek finally got the door leading to the bridge to open, there was this pink glow illuminating the entire room. It was coming from the, the big screen. Mission status, engine report, overheated and burned out, not functional. Status of crew, Captain John C. Bonington, dead. First Officer Fred Gordon, dead. Second Officer Susan Hepperton, dead. Third Officer Thomas Jeffrey, dead. Jane Milton Navigator, dead. Tony C. Norman Cook, dead. Simon Gilbert, chef engineer, dead. Derek E. Smith, alive. Health and safety, one. Water purification system inactive, two. Food replicators, not enough power, three. Planet has breathable air, four. The Scrabble has survived the crash, five. Communication satellite, damaged, can only receive emails, six. Standby, seven. Standby, eight. Ship's robot, cannot locate, nine. Air conditioning system, not enough power. Chapter 3. Burying the Dead It was just one of those things you can't have all the dead sitting around getting smelly and what have you. Because the ship was now running on life support, which it could sustain for 80 years flat, it meant that the ship's crematorium did not have enough power to function. So, Derek chose an area nearby, just outside a cave, and proceeded to bury the entire crew there. Each member had a cross with their name on it. Chapter 4. The Search for Food There was really only one food source, it seemed. This strange, small, brown, broccoli-looking weed that grew everywhere. The creatures outside the ship ate it. Derek ran the scanner on it, and it turned out it was safe for human consumption. You could grind it down and turn it into a flower if need be. It did not have a very nice taste. Chapter 5. A Trip to the Communications Room it was a bit of a mess in there. Paper scattered all over the floor, a light was flickering, and the main computer screen would work for a little while, but you had to keep bumping it with your fist every now and again. There was apparently an email Derek could access, so he did. April 8th, 3025. Subject, urgent. Read now, very important. Um, there might be a slight problem with your spacecraft, Derek. It seems I forgot to install the engine cooling system the one that kicks in just after hyperspace travel, that could cause some disastrous consequences. I hope you get this email before it's too late. You don't seem to be answering your phone. Kevin. The message was on the screen long enough for Derek to read it. He was, of course, not terribly amused by this new information, but not at all surprised. Chapter 6. Mapping the Area Derek visited the main cargo bay and unpacked the theodolite. He had been a land surveyor in a past job. Normally, the job would be done by the drones, but they were all destroyed in the crash. It turned out that to the north, there appeared to be what looked like a walled area with a crack in it. It looked like it had been nibbled on. It would be quite a long hike to get there, but Derek would do it one day. To the south, there were massive, haphazardly stacked cuboid structures. They could definitely be called skyscrapers, a odd hodgepodge of elongated vertical cube like skyscrapers, sometimes in clumps of four, 
but sometimes on their own. One was connected to a long viaduct that curved round and eventually connected to a large rocky outcrop. To the east, there were these large herds of quadruped creatures roaming the flatlands. They seemed very peaceful and didn't even jump when Derek had to kill one for food. The food replicators you see required more power and emergency ration packs got destroyed in the accident. They did need a name, though, so Derek called them the Zardukes. Chapter 7 Training a Zarduk for Long-Distance Travel It was remarkably easy for Derek to get the Zarduk to cooperate for some bizarre reason. After just three days of training, it could do all the things a earth horse could do. Walk, trot, canter, and gallop. Chapter 8 The Second Trip to the Communications Room Derek was curious to see if there were more messages. When he got to the communications room, a small creature got startled and came running out of the room. There were holes all over the ship, and these things were now investigating rooms and corridors. Derek powered up the computer and found that there were indeed two new emails he could access, so he did. Let's see what this is all about, said Derek. Subject, to all personal working on the Deep Space Banana Project. I work hard and I play hard. I expect the best because I am the best. I want the sort of people who are willing to go above and beyond, people with passion and purpose. I want it to be known that space mechanic Kevin is not the sort of person I want out there on the front lines searching for the new banana. And while I'm here, why do all the pens keep going missing from my desk? Henry C. Archibald, the fourth president, Space Command, Earth. And the other email. Subject. No subject. Hi, Derek. You know, I remember the first time I went to Venus. Did you know that the first person to set foot on Venus was a woman? She was called Susan Winterbottom and was from Lorado, Texas. She enjoyed collecting miniature socks, socks from all over the world. Her favorite were a tiny pair from Russia. Can you imagine that? Derek shut down the console, left the communications room, and went to bed. Chapter 9. The Heavy-Duty Storage Box The next day, Derek saw one of the Zardukes nudging something with its head. The creature had found one of the ship's famous plastic heavy-duty storage box E's. It was embedded into the sand and was in perfect condition. Derek opened it up, and inside this thing were about 80 packets of British custard creams and 20 canisters of coffee. 